Hi, so I wanted to film this yesterday, but I decided that it had basically turned into like a weird ranty thing and I was waffling and I wasn't happy with it, so I decided to just bite the bullet and reshoot. And what I wanted to talk about was the way that Welsh culture has basically been sidelined as a part of early medieval Britain. Like everybody talks about the Anglo Saxons, everybody talks about the Vikings. People talk about the Irish, people talk about the Picts, nobody really talks about the Welsh. And a lot of people kind of see them as this kind of backward little brother culture in Britain in the early medieval period. And that really bugs me, and it bugs me for a number of reasons. And I think that I will split it into kind of three, if I can. And I think the three that I'm going to go for are uh, the artistic and cultural achievements, uh, the archaeology, uh, and the <clears throat> kind of living history side of things. Starting with the artistic and cultural stuff, you get an awful lot of... I mean, it's everywhere. The Viking poetry, Anglo-Saxon poetry, things like Beowulf and the Eddas and the, um, the sagas and things like that from the Vikings you don't hear very much about Welsh poetry, and Welsh poetry is one of the largest collections we have of early medieval British writing. We've got poems from people like uh, Aneirin and Taliesin and people like that, and they're called the Beirth, or the Kinveirth, the, the Bards, or the Early Bards. And not only are they poets, like we would know them today, like people who write and transmit poetry, they are legitimate courtiers. So these are guys who have royal or noble patrons, they appear at court, they um, they broadcast, they transmit their work through courtly activity, they are commissioned to regularly write poems and perform them. Um, they, they sing their poems at feasts and at religious events, and they are legitimate nobility. These bards, a bard, a bard, that's where we get the word bard from, from the Welsh word bard. Um, <clears throat> Bardoniaeth is poetry in Welsh. It's like, pretty obvious that that's the root word. And one of them, uh, I think it's a neirin, is a bard teile, which translate in English as a household bard, or a family bard. The word teile means family in modern Welsh. In early medieval Wales, the teile, if you've played uh, medieval to Total War Britannia, you'll already know this, is basically a king's retinue, a bodyguard. And within the tailor you have a barth. And the job of the barth tailor is basically the same as a Norse skald. And a skald goes off and writes poems about how great the king is, presents them to the king at court, sings them in front of everybody in the court so everybody knows how great the king is. Barth does exactly the same thing. And the Battle of Catraith, which is a huge epic um, story of an early medieval, I think 6th century battle of the Britons versus the Anglo-Saxons is written by a Bardath Taylor, a man who was there, he was at the battle, he fights in the battle, he goes off, he writes a big poem about it, and it's all very sad because uh, the Britons lose against the Saxons who invade from Germany, and obviously it becomes this huge trope of early medieval Welsh poetry that the Saxon bad, the Saxon invader, is evil. Uh, which is confusing for later on, we'll talk about that later. But yeah, we have this huge system already in place by the 6th, 7th centuries of poetic patronage and artistic patronage in royal courts. And that's not something that exists in a backward, barbaric, Romano-British little tribal system. That's something that exists in an area and a culture that is well-established, that has a system of aristocracy and nobility, it's a feudal system, it has uh, cultural and territorial uh, limits and mores that are adhered to, and a little later on, culturally speaking, uh, we have things like Hoel Var, Hoel the Good, who's one of very few early medieval kings who has the epithet, the good, who is credited with writing down the laws of Hoel. <clears throat> I think the earliest copies we've got from the 13th century and the 14th century, but uh, they're widely kind of considered to date from Howell's time, at least most of them. And they have things like 
compensation for various crimes, up to and including murder, um, assaults of various kinds. It has compensation for a variety of civil offences. It goes into great detail about the various types of courtiers, like the the, um, the Hebogid and the Pen Hebogid, the Falconer and the Head Falconer, the Cook, the Magistrates, all the bodyguards, where people sit in the dining hall when you're having a feast. And it mentions, really importantly, that courtiers, like all the court, all the members of the court, get their woolens and their linens from the King and Queen three times a year. And that is something that in the high medieval and late medieval and early modern period is going on in most of the courts of Europe. Like, that is a thing. That is a Europe-wide royal tradition that is happening in Wales. So, far from being, like, artistically, culturally backward, it is on a par with all of the other European courts in terms of its development. And this is like Viking period and just after. It's it's like everywhere else. Archaeologically, part two. Archaeologically, <clears throat> we struggle a bit in Wales with textiles. Because the soil is really acidic. Uh, it's a lot like um, parts of Ireland and, and a lot of Scotland where we have really acidic soil. Um, we have terrible weather in a lot of places. <clears throat> very moist soil in certain areas that's good for some stuff and it's bad for other stuff. So the archaeology in Wales has been slightly neglected, but we have got some amazing sites and I have a couple of books on this so I should go and get them. Yes. We got them boys, we got them. So yeah, there's all of this talk. You see it on the internet a lot where it says there's very little archaeology from early medieval Wales. And like, oh, Wales in the Viking period is this great big mystery. Well, I not really. Like, we know the names of the kingdoms in Wales. We know the names of all of the kings of those kingdoms and their descendants. We have poetry about them. We have, like, continuity of a lot of the, the settlements in Wales. Like, the place I'm from, Bangor, our, our cathedral is one of the oldest in Britain. And it is pre-Viking. Um, it is old, like it's old, like 7th century old, and we have plenty of evidence that the Welsh were going on pilgrimages, they were fully aware of all of the European revolutions going on and the political situation in like Carolingian Europe and the papacy, and they were practising this uh, insular, a lot of people call it the Irish or the Columban form of Christianity with like pilgrimages and monks and monasteries and caves. And there's archaeology from lots of these sites. And one of my favourite books on, or series of books on the archaeology of early, mod early medieval Wales is this one. So this is the corpus of early medieval carved, in, uh, early medieval inscribed stones in Wales. And it's from the University of Wales Press. And it's by um, Nancy Edwards <clears throat> and Mark Redknapp, and it has all of the carved stones from Wales. Now, this is volume three of three, and it's huge, like, it's, it's massive, it's an inch and a half thick, and these stones are amazing, they have loads of stuff on them, they have, um, they have names, they have text, they have, um, Christian, uh, dedications, they have um, the names of who owned the land, they have the date of the transfer of the land from one person to the other, they have the names of the witnesses of the land transfer, like, it's it's a developed system of, like, property and boundary markers, and we know that from the laws of Hoelvar and poems that there was this system of legal and, like, economic law in place already by the Viking period in Wales. The other huge, amazing book, which is also a Mark Redknapp with Alan Lane, um, is this, Sangors Cranog. And a Cranog, uh, if you don't know what a Cranog, a Cranog is, it's basically uh, a house on an island, put really simply. And you find them in Ireland, you find them in Scotland, and we've got one in Wales. And it's this one, Sangors, and it's amazing. And it has, this book just has so much in it including the most important textile find 
in early medieval Wales, which is this, the Sangors textile. And it's mental because it is an incredibly fine silk embroidery on a linen base. And I'm not going to show you too much of it because it's like it's an academic book and I don't want to get in trouble, but it's it's incredible and it has all of this detail. Like it has incredible detail on like the reconstruction of the patterns and an analysis of the cloth and where it came from and how it was made and all of the details on it and it's just insane. And as well as that, there's evidence of craft activities, there's woodworking, there's metalworking, there's bronze working, there's iron working, um, there's a huge amount on the National Museum of Wales, and there's no excuse not to go to it because the website is museum.wales or Um and in their collection they have gold penannular brooches, they have jewellery, they have swords, they have spearheads, they have whetstones, they have coins, Islamic, Carolingian, Anglo-Saxon, they're from everywhere. There's evidence of contact with all of these other cultures from the archaeology, so we know that Wales was as active as other parts of Britain. In terms of the settlements, we know that there were Irish and Norwegians given land, they were granted land in Wales, a place called San Bedurgoch on Ernest Morn, on Anglesey, which is basically a Viking settlement. It looks like it might have been a trade hub, certainly it was a crafting centre. We have places further south. The Cranog style of Sangors suggests maybe it was given to an Irishman. We know that there was intermarriage between the Irish and the Welsh. We know that the Norwegians and the Welsh were allied at one point against the Normans. Like Wales is part of this Irish sea culture that is incredibly important in the period. Like We have the Kingdom of Man and the Isles. The Norwegians are really, really active there. It's not a little backwater. It is a trade network across the Irish Sea. It's a huge, huge trading network. So the archaeology of Wales isn't poor. It's that it's poor in textile finds. But so is the archaeology of Scotland, and really so is the archaeology of England. I mean, we've got bog bodies and stuff in Ireland preserved in the peat bogs, but you don't really expect to find early medieval textile finds a lot in most parts of Britain. So the third part of this is the reenactment and what really, really urinates me off about early medieval Welsh reenactment is there is this overwhelming make yourself look a bit poorer attitude which is a. Insulting, B. Not based on any real evidence, and C. Just really insulting. Just gonna do that twice, because um, it really gets on my wick. And the idea that Hoelvar, who could read and write and speak in Welsh, Old English, French, Latin, Greek, was this poverty-stricken, backward king of this nasty, muddy little corner of Britain just doesn't fit, does it? Really. When the poems of the 7th century in Wales are talking about Alexander the Great and advanced astronomy and are composed using these huge, complex forms, are written down and are also being composed by people who are familiar with things as varied as Greek and Roman, Byzantine and Carolingian society and poetry. Why are you telling your reenactors to, like, not wear trousers when we have descriptions of trousers? Why are you telling them to just, like, not wear shoes? Why would you, why would you do that? And yeah, I know that there's this picture, but that picture is widely discredited because it's from an incredibly biased story, an incredibly biased portrayal of the Welsh as these poor people who have no manners. When we have, like, texts on how to treat your guests in your palace, it's just nonsense, it's just nonsensical. So if you are a reenactor or you're in charge of a reenactment group and somebody says, I want to portray an early medieval Briton or a Welshman, 
absolutely encourage them to go and look at the archaeology. Encourage them to go and look at books like this, because books like this, although they are huge and expensive and difficult to get hold of if you don't have the money for books, this is, this is where the knowledge is. This is where the information is, not Facebook, not other reenactors necessarily, because reenactors very, very often are set in their ways and think that their research is the right research, but if your reenactor friends are giving you links to articles and archaeology and actual good information like this, then you are with the right kind of reenactors, my friend. Because early medieval Wales is a place where we have finds like this. That's not poverty stricken. Like, okay, we haven't found any chainmail yet, okay, we haven't found any helmets, but how much Viking Age chainmail have we found in England? How many Viking Age helmets have we found in England? Maybe one. The Yarm helmet is maybe a Viking Age helmet. So, where do you get off saying stuff like the Welsh looked really poor in the period? when Hollyhead is a few hours sailing away from Dublin on a sunny, windy day. Like, I don't comprehend. How do you say that the Welsh are really, like, backward when we have all of this literary evidence that they were really advanced artistically? I will be putting some videos together about my early medieval Welsh look soon, so hang in there and stay tuned. But if you are portraying a Welshman in your early medieval reenactment, for goodness sake, don't just go with the accepted. They looked poor. They probably had to cover their chainmail in leather because it rains in Wales. Like, that's garbage! And I've heard people say that. I've heard people say, you can cover your chainmail in leather. Like, put a leather jerkin over your chainmail. That is... Cajitaru. That is not the case. Like, I'm, I've no idea where you get that from, because... That's not something you see in English reenacting, that's not something you see in Scottish reenacting, that's not something you see in Irish reenacting. And it rains there as well. Like, yeah, it's wet in Wales, but come on. Like, seriously. It's not that bad. I've got sunburn doing excavation in Wales before now. Early medieval Wales is not what you think it is if you think that it is a place that is backward and poverty-stricken and has no real natural resources and no development. It is a place where we have we have urban areas. They're not as big as, say, York or um, London, Canterbury, uh, places like Dublin. But we do have Viking settlement. We do have trade centres. We do have a network of religious sites. We have cathedrals. We have pilgrimage. We have uh, courtly nobility, and we have royals with regular court calendars, and we have a system of nobility and serfdom, just like in other uh, early feudal areas. So, although we speak a Britonic language, and we have the Celtic version of Christianity, it's still an early medieval Catholic culture. For a lot of the period, it's not a united country. It is in the in the mid-11th century, but it's not for a lot of the period. It's still following an awful lot of the trends in Western Europe because it's really closely connected to them. It is very close to Ireland. It's very close to France. It's next door to the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms. It's very close to what becomes Scotland. And we have to remember that in the sub-Roman period, I think it's the 6th century, the Britons go off and conquer Brittany. There's a connection with northern France. In fact, the saint that Bangor Cathedral is dedicated to is Saint Daniel. Saint Denois is in Brittany. So thank you very much for bearing with me on this one. This is a, a little second take. I did a, a kind of ranty version of this yesterday. I just wasn't happy with it. I was really waffly. I didn't have the books. Um, so, yeah. Thank you very much for bearing with me. Uh, you may have noticed that there are a couple of adverts on some of my videos now. I'm very happy to announce that I have reached the stage where I can monetize my channel, which sounded big and scary until I realized it just means having adverts at the start. And I am making them skippable because adverts you can't skip really annoy me. And I haven't put any in the middle of the videos because that's really stupid and annoying. I don't want ad breaks. That's... 
Like, it's not... It's not ITV. I don't want you having ad breaks in the middle of my YouTube videos. That's nonsensical. So, I'm not doing that. It works for other people, it doesn't work for me. Um, no criticism to anybody who has mid-roll ads, by the way, if any of my, my, my fellow people who do these are, are watching. Um, no critique of that at all. So, I, I hope that's okay with you. I have some interesting plans for stuff going forward. I'm going to do some more early medieval Welsh stuff, um, because that is important stuff that is important to me, and I'm passionate about it. So, diolchem awr iawn unwaith eto am a minno a fi. Thank you very much for joining me. And, uh, yeah, hopefully I will see you very shortly. Diolchem awr am tan ysgrifio pawb sydd wedi. Thank you very much for subscribing, everyone who has. Will I hitro nesa? Who will I matro? See you next time. Bye for now. I drink some tea. I'm gonna re-record my video where I was quite grumpy because I was outside. Shoo-biddy-doo.